assuming everyone's going to be in the back. That's a lot up here, so hopefully it's a lot of back there. Um, so the title of the talk is Designing a Theme for Performance. Um, I'm going to assume there's a bit of a mixture between you know, designers that don't do any development and some designers that are doing some front-end development. So I'll be going over uh, a bit, bit mixture of the talk um, between those two types of topics. Um, in my talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about my company, um, just really quickly, um, and about me, so you have the background of myself. And then I'll get into the why it's important. I think that's really critical for people to come away from these types of talks, to be able to sell it um, to whether they're clients or their, their bosses or, or executives, um, because one thing to learn how to do it, but they're not going to give you the time to do it. Um, that's another, another issue. So, go through some tools um, that I've used over the years and, and even recently. Um, and then um, reduce, reuse, recycle, which will make more sense when we get to that. Um, and then also close out, assuming we have some time, um, with some trends, some, some internet trends, um, so you can give us some more stats and, and find, find out more information. Um, so about Endeavor, uh, we were, we're a new company. We were founded last year, um, just over a year, year ago. We we're a distributed company. Uh, most of our employees are actually in, in the New York, New Jersey office, or area, no, no offices, we're distributed. Um, I live out in Colorado, um, along with another employee. Um, and our average experience is actually pretty high uh, uh, among agencies. We're average is actually 15 years. Um, and the other thing that, about us is that we offer our employees a 10% open source plan. So at least four hours a week, they're allowed to, or actually encouraged to, to contribute back to open source projects, develop species like this. Um, but that's actually close to four to eight hours a week because um, we give them another four hours to do internal things. Myself, I'm the president of the company. Um, I, I do have a technical background, um, and I've been building websites actually for almost, um, well, getting closer to 20 years actually, um, and professionally for 18 years uh, of that. Um, I just moved out to Colorado, um, and here's some information. If you want to contact me, I'll be around obviously as well, but if you ever wanted to reach out and ask after the talk. Um, quickly, some of our, our WordPress clients. We are a new company. Um, we're able to quickly, pretty quickly engage with, with some pretty large brands um, on, on their engineering side. Um, and I'd like to open up with some, maybe some initial questions, but it's kind of a big room, so I'll kind of make some assumptions. But mainly for this slide, if you wanted to go and find these slides, there, there's a lot of links in this slide, and some of the links are even long, and even the bit link was a bit long. Um, but if you take a picture of it, it's just uh, bit.ly slash endeavor dash design dash perf um, to keep a little shorter. Um, that way you can follow along or just get the links. I have a lot of it up at the end as well. Um, so first off, so why is it important? I wanted to go through a quick case study of a, of a client of ours that we, we took on recently. Um, and this first one is a video. Um, I'll explain the video. It's on the right side, you're going to see the, the new site, the new, new improvements. Um, and on the left side, um, you'll see the site as it was before we took it on. And it'll go to the home page, a channel page, and then a, and an article page to give you an idea of kind of what the end user has to deal with if they were able to click right away as soon as they see the page load. Um, and hopefully the wi my Wi-Fi is good, but I can switch over to local. Maybe the Yahoo for the... There we go. So on the right side, I already went to the home page. Um, that's loaded. I'm going to go click on something. I'm going to go into the channel page, like I said. Um, that's loading. You know, this isn't super fast, but this was with, with just a few days of improvements on our part. It's already on the article page on the right side um, at this point. Um, on the left side, you'll see it's actually on the uh, channel page, finally. Um, and it's still loading the channel page. And in another few seconds, it will load the article page. Start two of these. Um, and about 40 seconds into this, I believe it was, they were able to see three pages on the website. Um, so as you can imagine, a lot of, a lot of users were dropping off um, on a site like that. I mean, this is an extreme case, but even incremental improvements um, do, do make a difference. So this was some of the initial stats from um, Google Analytics. Um, as you can see, they're, they're, their uh, stats are pretty, left, pretty much like any normal site where you go up and down depending on the day. They have good articles certain, certain days that get picked up by, by Facebook or core users. Um, but then around May 22nd, just after that date, um, is when we started making the improvements over the course of three days, just a few. Um, and the sessions climbed dr pretty dramatically, as you can tell. Now, here's the actual stats. So sessions were up. This is a month's uh, worth of data. 
So a month compared to another, uh, the previous month, it was up 67%, users were up 57%, page views were up 47%. Um, now this has had a few things. Um, it, it wasn't all, oh, all right, we fixed their site and, and we're just amazing or anything like that. They had some really good, great content all, along that time as well. Um, but they've had really great content before and they couldn't have spikes. And the problem was the site was going down. Um, so when we took over, it, the big thing wasn't just to make their site faster to help the end users, it was also just to keep it stable. Um, so when they would get spikes, they couldn't have this increase because they couldn't maintain it. Um, so there, there was a, a little bit of that as well. But you know, the idea is if, if your site is responsive, people are going to share it because um, they're going to see it faster and they're going to get a good impression of you. But also, if they don't see it at all, they're never going to share it, um, clearly. Um, and, and some more information, um, so why else, right? Because mobile. Um, you know, mobile devices are typically, smaller devices are typically on, you know, they're, they're a mix. There's, there's sometimes you're on good Wi-Fi, whether you're at Starbucks or at work. But a lot of times you're on the go, um, seeing sites. You know, these are, these, trend, these are graphs showing the trends of the trending up. Um, for 303 Magazine, which was the site that I showed before, their traffic is actually 87% um, small device. So they're, they're even more critical to, to start to focus on the mobile devices and, and the front end performance of, the, of those. Um, so we talked about data speed. You know, the smaller devices, they're, they're, they're looking at a smaller area of your site. Um, and if it's not loading uh, and something else on the, on the page is loading, that's obviously a, a bad impression as well. Um, and then the third one I want to talk about, and I've talked about this quite quite a bit in the past, and I used to have this slide and saying, you know, in 2010, Google came out with saying, um, if people aren't going to improve their performance, it's going to start getting into the algorithm. That happened. Um, they put it in there. If you improve your site performance, you know, you're, you're, you went up a little bit, or at least stayed stable. If you didn't, you started to come down on their algorithm. Um, but unfortunately, we as you know, as an industry, as, as a web development industry, um, didn't really adhere to that too closely, and we kept adding, at least big media companies kept adding more tracking, more images, bigger images, custom fonts, and we'll talk about that later too, um, for, good or, for better or worse. Um, so we didn't listen to them, and then they decided to come out with Google AMP, and then Facebook came out with instant articles, and, and basically, so any traffic coming from there, they want to use those, um, because those are highly performant and, and tied for their, for their users. So now we're, we're not stuck, but we can we can style these a little bit better. But we've kind of been pushed back into you know a, a bare minimum for for that type of traffic for the most part. Because now if we don't use AMP, well that's of course going to be part of the algorithm, and they're going to you know not go to the regular site anyways. So you can style it more than we've styled the one on the left. Um, that's our site where we haven't spent a lot of time making it great because we're an engineering company. Um, we're kind of we're not a design agency. Uh, but we'll, we'll eventually add some style, our brand colors and things like that, so you can add that. But what you can't really add right now um, is a heavy amount of tracking, um, the type of, you know, if you wanted to do some testing and, and things like that, that's much more difficult for these. So we're going to be limited for a little while again. Um, some tools now. So we talked about why. I want to get into some tools. This was a tool I showed you a minute ago. This is an interesting tool because it's not really going to help you fix your site, but it's an interesting way to test your site. Um, you can test it in the way I showed you before, where you can make some improvements, see how visually um, enhanced it is. Um, you can compare yourself to competitors if you'd like to do that. Um, on the right, the one drawback, so I'm, I'm comparing Drupal.org to WordPress.org. Um, but thankfully, both of these have actually switched to HTTPS, and, and this tool actually doesn't, um, while it's served off of HTTPS, it, doesn't, it can't make those requests at, at the moment. So, it's a little bit limited where you'd have to do non-secure sites or fake that for, for yourself to be able to test two, two non-secure sites. Um, but it is a pretty good tool for, for quickly showing you know, either yourself or stakeholders um, why the site needs to be better. Um, another great tool um, is books. Um, this book in particular, um, I've, I've read before. Um, it's, it's done by a woman, um, Laura, who, who runs the engineering or a, a engineering team um, at Etsy. Um, Etsy is a company that has a lot of open source um, that they've sent back, a lot of talks, a lot of um, contributing back, and her team, I, I believe her team is primarily focused on performance, so there's tons of information um, that you can find from her, but the book is actually really concise. Um, it's not a massive book, 
Um, and the other part, good parts about it is that she actually donates all the all the proceeds to uh, a few chair or a few um, areas of education um, for for lower for underprivileged people or for things a few other organizations that are really great. So it's not about making tons and tons of money for herself, and it's it's a really good book also. Um, so another tool um, that I wanted to talk about is you know not for ourselves, but we built a a dev well we call it a dev stack that is a virtual machine. So as a designer, you may not understand how, how to do this necessarily, but if you're part of a company with an engineering team, um, or if you, if you just follow you know, the basic instructions, um, what this allows you to do is basically monitor um, a site, a number of sites, a number of pages um, over the course of however you'd like to do and get some great stats on that. Um, and it's free because you know, these are all based on other open source tools. So we've basically put them, put them together in a way that it's kind of all in one box that allows you to do, um, put three tools together. So sitespeed.io is one of them, and that's the URL right there. So on its own, sitespeed will, yes? Is there a way to expand that? How did that happen? I just oh, right, because I switched. Sorry. I, just, um, I can probably zoom in too. <coughs> Thanks. Um, so the first one up on top, the sitespeed.io, um, they're an open source product that allows you to do, the, the bulk of, of what this does is um, put in different sites, it'll monitor them for a ton of different data. Um, you then have to get that data into some place, and you know, they have documentation, and we've, we've put it into uh, a tool called Graphite. Um, and Graphite comes with, out of the box, a, a pretty nice graphing. Um, at least it shows all the data, so it kind of looks like this. Um, so you can start to look at all the data points and, and evaluate them again over a course of time because you're going to make some changes, um, which we can talk about later, and it's going to make some improvements, but it po possibly might make some uh, other, it might degrade some other things, and this will monitor the entire um, website for you. But the nice thing about um, the open source world is that always people are improving. So Grafana is a is a dashboard tool and a graphing tool, which makes it look a lot nicer. Um, and you can take these this tool and merge the data. You can do pretty much if you're really into data, you can take the Grafana um, and, and monitor almost anything that you're, you're putting the data. Because SiteSpeed doesn't just do the how long it, it loads. It tells you how, much, how many CSS files you have, how big the CSS files. You know, same thing for JavaScript. It'll tell you uh, on, on multiple browsers, so you can test for Chrome, Firefox, even Internet Explorer. You can test third-party um, scores, so Google has a score, Wyslow has a score, all of those can be, can be monitored as well. Um, too much for a, for a talk like this, though, unfortunately. Um, you can start here, and then there's links in this GitHub repository to actually go into it a little bit, quite a bit deeper if you like. Um, So, if you don't have the time to set that up, these tools do a lot of the same types of things. So these are tools that are, go from free up to paid uh, in different levels. Um, so I'll talk about each one of them a little bit. Pingdom um, and Statuscape um, are, are pretty similar with, the, with what I was telling you before. You can basically you sign up to them. You can get all, quite a bit of free information, actually, out of both of those. So the nice thing about them as well is they, they can do alerts. So they can alert you if your site's down, which is not about performance, but it would be kind of nice to know. Um, you, you put in some URLs, you can monitor both the, the site speeds, site weight um, for, for both of those two. Speed curve actually does, a, does quite a bit more. Um, the pricing though, the, the top two are pretty cheap as far as you can monitor quite a few sites if you're a you know, freelancer, a smaller agency, or if you have just a number of sites in, in, in your company. Um, for, for relatively inexpensive, and I'm talking about, you know, teens to, to 20 or $30 a month um, for the top two. Speed curve, I, I believe the last time I looked at, at the pricing, um, it, it goes up quite a bit more, but the, the graphing is pretty impressive um, to me. Um, New Relic, which I should have put maybe in a little bit different order, um, does quite a bit more, um, and it's also, you know, can be quite a bit more expensive, but the amount of data you get for your entire stack of development, so the whole back end, all the way through front end is impressive, but it does have a front end component as well, just like these other three that can monitor. Um, the, the big nice thing about New Relic is it actually monitors your actual users, so it's not just 
their servers, um, you know, going out and looking and seeing how they how they do. But it's actual traffic, um, which is really um, is really key because sometimes these other other servers get a little bit different impression of your site. Um, these three tools um, are things that you can actually use. So the first one is we're talking about monitoring and just seeing how things are going. But these are, are the three tools that are like, all right, I know I have a problem. I don't know what it is. I can use any one of these three. Um, go on there. They're web-based. I type in a URL. I hit enter. It does some monitoring. And, and it, it gives me some information. Some of the information that for designers that's specific is actually tells you, you know, that your images might not have been compressed. Um, you know, just because you're, you're a designer doesn't mean that you're doing all the creative for your site, but you're the one getting blamed for, you know, the, the image is being too big. Well, now you can look at the, the page and, and see, see how big the, the uncompressed, you know, photos are, are on the site. Um, it'll tell you if, if you should be doing some, some lossless or, or even if you should be compressing your CSS or JavaScript, um, if you have control over that. But it gives you a grade, you know, obviously A on the top of it is the best. Um, you know, page speed on, on the bottom is, you know, pretty closely tied to Google's algorithm as far as, you know, if you're getting a good grade there, you can assume you're getting, you know, a good grade in Google's algorithm for, for performance. Um, you can monitor if it's, if it's mobile or not as well. Um, I use these, again, when I'm, you know, if, if I know there's a problem, I need to go in there and, and evaluate it really quickly. So while I can look at the site and, and you know, do other things manually, I can just go here, put in a URL and let it, let it run for me. Um, another thing is, is, is hosting. Um, you know, if you're hosting on a, on a cheaper host and you're no, well, if you, if you have performance problems, um, you know, this is one thing that you can take a look at pretty quickly if you're, if you're hosting on a cheaper host. A lot of, lot of uh, sponsors out there that do hosting. Um, I, I don't think any of those are in this bucket. Um, you know, you can, you can evaluate them differently. But it, it also depends on what you're, what you're trying to get out of, the, out of the site. So you can pay for highly performant hosting. You can pay for, for solid um, performant hosting. And, and there's the, the pricing is going to be you know, vastly different. Um, but it doesn't mean that one's better or, or worse depending on their type of pricing. But when you're talking you know, a lower, lower tier, you're kind of getting what you're paying for, uh, having performance issues. Um, so getting into um, some of the things you can start doing. First off, um, as a designer, sometimes you have some, some control over this, specifically around you know, the choice of using ping, gif, jpeg for, for all, of, all of your images, um, for, the, for the, how the look and feel of the site is, is factoring in. Um, I'm, not, I'm actually not going to go into, you know, SVG and how to use them very often, but the most most sites have switched into using SVG for a lot of the, the, the creative aspects of, of the site. Not not the photos, obviously, but a big reason for this is that SVGs are essentially code, um, you know, that you can manipulate very easily. So a lot of the icons that we see today are, are you know, social icons and things, and things like that are, are actually SVGs, and you can go you can customize those um, along the way. This this link is actually another session to talk about some of the pitfalls because if it was if it was perfect and we should be using them all the time um, or, or there was no issues then everyone would be using them all the time but unfortunately there's still some pitfalls around cross browser um, and, and you know, things like that that they go into. Um, the next thing is as you know the designer if, if you've or, or designer and developer if you if you have control over the site um, as far as you know fixing the 400s and 500s um, I'm going to skip that one a little bit but that's essentially performance of your site and usability. Um, the big thing around optimizing content, if you have any, if you're in control of the UI, um, whether you're designing the, the, the UI UX for, for an initial client or a redesign, um, I'm talking about, you know, home pages tend to, to grow um, pretty quickly. Um, you know, they have, they start out with a few, few images and, and articles linking from them and they grow to 50 um, pretty quickly um, on bigger sites. Um, everyone wants their stuff on the home page or channel pages. Um, you know, the, the amount of stuff that you're going to put on the home page is going to greatly reduce the performance of the site, whether it's images or just content um, alone. Um, the other part of it, as you know, is, would be just usability and, and you know, how, how much they have to scroll. So optimizing their content, whether you have control over that or if you can encourage others, um, is pretty important for performance. Um, talked about this a little bit before. This is what the, site, the thing on the right is about, aggregating your CSS and JavaScript. Um, you know, if, 
if you're pulling in a lot of jQuery plugins for some usability stuff, some, some cool animations or things like that, the, what you're going to see on the right is going to start to add up on a, on a WordPress site or any site, really. So you've got, I, I've blurred this for, for good reason, but if you can imagine that the top section on the blue is a lot of, is like 10 style sheets, and the bottom is like 30 JavaScript files, it looks like. Um, you know, so the, there's a lot of different libraries going on here. Um, a lot of things can be done in a few lines of code. A lot of things can be done with a little bit of research. Um, if you're, if you have access to a development team, you know, they can help you, you consolidate that, so aggregating that, but also just eliminating some of it, possibly. Um, but then, of course, you can add other JavaScript libraries to do lazy loading. So I'm going in the anti part of that. But lazy loading, if you're not familiar with that term, the best example is pretty much any app that you have, um, a, a native app, so whether you're on Android or, or iPhone, as you're scrolling through images, they're loading, right? So when you op open up the app, which is a news app or Facebook or anything like that, the images that you see are the ones that have loaded. You scroll up and then they start to load. That's what lazy, lazy loading is. You can do that on the web as well. Um, so whether you're desktop or, or you know, responsive for, for a smaller device, you can still do this, and especially for the smaller devices. Um, because again, we talked about they're on the move, possibly. Um, they may or may not have a great um, internet connection. So having them load all the pages, and maybe your page is not responsive until those images are loading, um, it is a major hit. Because if they only have to load three images versus 20, um, you know, instead of having to load the images, they can actually be loading the content that you want them to see. Oops. This is the one too long. All right. So some of the better parts about a, about, a, about a WordPress site is that we can contribute back or utilize the contributions of others. So these plugins are specific around images um, that, are, that are all freely available. Um, you know, if you use them, you can obviously contribute back if you have different issues. You can also make requests for them. The first one is, is actually an automatic um, jetpack. It is the main plugin, but it has a number of what they call submodules in that one, and Photon is that. The Photon will, so rather than if you spin up, or if you have your WordPress site and you upload images, all the images are served from your site. Um, so you have content and images served from your site. Just by enabling Photon, um, it actually sends the, basically puts those images on automatic servers, essentially. But it'll make one request for the image, and then every user after that will pull that image off of, off of their servers. Um, so if you envision the idea that rather than having every, so if you went from you know, 10 users, let's just use small numbers, to 100 users in growth, um, you have one image that gets served from your site, not 100. Um, and if you're doing it per second, per hour, obviously this becomes more important. But even for sites that don't have a ton of traffic, um, they're able to serve these images probably a lot faster and potentially even local or closer to the, to the end user. So you're getting a performance boost just by that, even if you don't um, have a full ton of traffic on your site. You image optimizer and, and Kraken are, those are plugins that you're going to be, they're going to be processing the image a little bit better, so they're going to be reducing the size for you. Um, there's good documentation of both of those, but these are, and then Compressed JPEG does, does a similar um, thing. Kraken also does something similar to Jetpack if you want to serve it off of their infrastructure. Um, but I would honestly recommend, you know, that you potentially, or even Jetpack alone, um, you know, if, if I was spinning up a new site, um, I would probably go with Jetpack alone initially because it can do um, the resizing for you, it can serve this image for you, it's hosted by Automatic, um, so the WordPress.com infrastructure is behind it. So, we went through that pretty quickly, so hopefully we have a lot of questions. But, oops, I'm going to go into the trends page. So this is what, what I talked about earlier about talking about some trends. So it's one thing to, to, you know, to talk about performance, and we all say, oh, it's important. Um, but unless you're getting stats and data um, from different places, um, it's not going to mean much to the people, like I was telling you before. Unless you're running your own company, or running your own site, and you do everything, and you can tell yourself that, oh yeah, this is important, I'm not going to do it. Most likely, we work for someone, whether it's a client or a boss, that we have to tell them how, you know, why it's important and why the, you know, why we need to make these improvements and spend time and money on it. Um, this, this is going to tell us a little bit more information about, you know, the web in general. Um, so it goes back 
So if you're not in, um, familiar with HTTP Archive, essentially HTTP Archive is imagining the archive of the web. It, it spiders the web, it spiders a bunch of data around the web, it does some ca caching, I guess, uh, of websites. Um, but the, this site, or this page on their site, trends.php, will actually aggregate a lot of that data and give some, some interesting graphs about how things have, have progressed. So it only, it's only showing us back to 2010. Um, I would love to show you kind of the, 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 the whole gamut of the web because it's actually an interesting kind of pattern um, that I can talk about. Basically what we've seen over the years is that sites were light. Um, we decided that as, you know, as designers or visual people, we want to add more images, more interactivity, so the sites started getting heavier again. Um, then we found out that, well, people don't like the sites that are looking pretty because they have to wait five or 10 seconds for them to load, so then they got light again. You know, you can envision a, a graph, I'll probably show you one down here that does something like that. Um, and like the CSS transfer sizes. So we, we keep going on this pattern. It's a cycle, um, essentially, that we, we get ourselves into over web development. We've probably done it about six times as far as you know, getting sites that are bloated, we shrink them down to a certain amount. We don't shrink them down to the original size because their bandwidth changes and gets better. Um, but if you look through the stats, it's an interesting cycle of, of how, how things are going. We're kind of on this cycle again where we're shrinking them down, especially with what I talked about with Google Ads and instant articles because they're the major players as far as driving traffic. So if they're going to push us to do something, um, the, the size of the, of the web in general um, is going to shrink again for a little while. But then we'll be able to add enhancements to that. Um, but you can go to this page and, and look at some different stats. Um, so one key one. Scroll down. It's all the way to the bottom. It's the one I like. Oh, wait. I looked at this just last night. Yeah, there it is, the red one. So we're still, we, we still have them out there, but over the last six years, you know, at one point it was like 80 or 90 percent because all the ads had them in them. So basically all sites that needed to drive revenue had them in. So we're down to about 15 percent according to, to the, their stats. Um, I think, I'm pretty sure that these are still just advertisers, but um, hopefully there's not too many sites out there that do the splash screen. Um, not to negate, you know, flash for, for performance necessarily, but just usability uh, more than anything. The one above it is sites using Google Libraries API, so it's specific to Google. Um, this is the idea that you're putting all your JavaScript files that we talked about before um, and serving them from Google. So similar to Photon, where you can say, you know, why don't you serve my, my, my images? You can say, why don't you serve my JavaScript so my site doesn't have to, to handle that. The, the next benefit of that is that if user A and user B went to someone else's site that did that, and then they go to your site, well, they've already got it cached. So, so they don't have to load that JavaScript library at all. So it's a, that's a big benefit if you can handle that. And then sites with custom fonts. Um, you know, custom, we've seen custom fonts growing uh, over the years, which was a great thing for a while because they were replacing images. Um, then we saw custom fonts taking over body content, which is good if, if you really need your, your body content to look a specific way. But essentially, you know, you, you're seeing sites with loading like four or five custom fonts. So now the fonts are actually larger than the images again. I talked about the cycle. Um, so now you're seeing sites like, well, for instance, GitHub, which is more technical, um, they're switching to, to back to system fonts again because the system fonts are actually getting nicer and cleaner. Um, so that's something you could evaluate as a designer to, to decide, well, do I want all these custom fonts or can I, can I utilize, at least for maybe a Mac, let's say, or, or if my, my traffic is all on mobile, um, those are going to have specific fonts that I might be able to utilize rather than a very specific custom font for, for performance specifically. So that trend might, might come down. So I think at this time, get to my question and answers. So, but first, for a quick review, we did talk about why it's important based on a case study and some data. Um, you know, this is something that you could find article after article about about these types of things. So if this wasn't, you know, directly. To, to your point, I didn't go over like an e-commerce model. I've done that in the past. So if you're an e-commerce site, there's a lot of data around that. Um, we did talk about a few tools um, and a few ways of, of, of implementing different some of those tools um, and quickly about the trends. So transition into questions. So I got 10, 10 minutes. Great. Yes. Okay.
Yeah, I can. So, so I talked about Vagrant. So we actually do use Vagrant for development, the engineering development on, on our site. So that's why we we use Vagrant for that one, the, the dev offer, the, the performance monitoring in a box. We called it. Um, there are tools um, for for WordPress. There's one called BVV, um, which we've actually used. Um, it is it's Vagrant, but it's a very specialized one for WordPress. Um, it's an open source one. It essentially, rather than trying to serve um, an Apache web server or other Nginx or anything like that in MySQL on your on your physical machine, it encapsulates that in, in a certain layer so that you, if you ever had to get rid of it, you delete some files and then it's, it's away rather than your whole machine having to be you know, re rebuilt. And also you can have different versions um, on your laptop. So it's, that's a little bit more technical. We can keep, I can keep going, but that's that's what they is used for. It, it, it simulates an entire server infrastructure. Yeah, on 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 one virtual we use virtual box, so it's a VM, our virtual machine. It is compatible, and it's you can actually do it for. So it it, it basically it would it's similar to replicating a hosting environment. If you think about it that way, so that's just your base layer. So then you still install WordPress and still add your themes and plugins. Um, so all they're all going to be compatible, especially with BBB, because it's specifically kind of tuned for for WordPress. Okay. Yes. You talk about tools for images, JavaScript. What about video? Performance of video. So 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 he asked about performance for video. Um, so. I haven't, I haven't personally looked into to video too much. As far as if I was trying to serve it, I tend to utilize third-party video software, or not software, but hosting um, capabilities, which are already, because the idea there is that you know, you're, they're going to do the compression, they're going to do the detection for a mobile device, for a desktop device, they're going to do the detection to see what, you know, what the speed of that, that user is, and then deliver the right video for you. Um, I have never built a video you know, delivery system, and that's the only way I would know how to do kind of improve this performance. Uh, so Vimeo and you know, a few others. Yes. I, yeah. So so walking into she asked if I have a standard procedure for kind of going through if, if I'm. A site that's broken, or not broken, but, but badly performing. So, the I'll, I'll walk through the 303 one pretty pretty quickly. So the first thing I evaluated on 303 was you know the front end a bit. So I used the I think I used Yslow. I also use I use Chrome. So I use I use developer tools inside of Chrome um, to get an idea. Is is there like a, a some low hanging fruit? Because um, that it, with anything, whether you're doing performance improvements or you know fixing usability, you want to fix the things that you can fix fast. And, and that are really affecting a lot of users. So I try to find things that are really slowing the, the site down. So for, and front end was, was kind of the key for that. Um, when I looked at that, their front end, while it was slow, I didn't see anything that was like glaring. The image sizes were pretty big. Um, but that wasn't something that I could fix across the board really quickly. Um, so that's why I had to, for them, I had to move back into the back end infrastructure. And I used um, to, to pitch them a little bit. New Relic um, that monitored the, the infrastructure. And that's immediately where I saw that I didn't even have the code at that point, but I could I could tell immediately that it was in the theme. Um, they used a, a premium theme that they paid for, um, downloaded, installed it, and it worked for a long time. And then they got to the point where they have hundreds of thousands of pieces of content, and they actually had a thousand pages. Um, so they, they were using pages in an interesting way, basically. Um, but the theme had loops, so they would go through all the pages and then build um, build. Widgets for for the, each page multiple times, so it was having twenty thousand queries on page. Um, so that was pretty low hanging fruit. Um, but you're, you're going to find those types of things, but but try to look for whether you're using monitoring tools or, or something else that is a clear you know performance issue. Because um, it's, it's, I, I tell everything, everyone kind of knows this. You get eight to eighty percent level pretty quickly. It's that last twenty or ten percent that you know they're not a performance site in my opinion yet. But the amount of time and cost is going to is going to take them a while to, to get to that point. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, like off offline servers like uh, Photon. What's your opinion of, of CDNs like Cloudflare? As as yes. Yeah. So we asked about my opinion on, on CDNs like Cloudflare. Um, we use Fastly as well for, for other things. 
Um, at this point, I would, I would, I don't know of a good reason necessarily to not use a CDN um, because they're free. Like Cloudflare um, has a free, a literally free level um, that also gives you um, HTTPS for free. Um, so, so you're getting an instant boost in, in, in performance. The other nice thing about CDNs, which is outside of performance, um, is security. Um, so they're, because they're serving so many sites, the reason that, that some of them are doing it at a free level is because they sell security on the site as well. But they're giving us some, some help on security. So if there's an attack, if there's a, a vulnerability, which is, is pretty key, whether it's WordPress that gets it released and you can't update your plugins fast enough or your or core fast enough, they'll already put a layer in, in front of that. Just like a lot of the hosting companies, but it's an extra layer. So even if you haven't updated your security possibly and it's a well-known threat, they'll, they'll basically eliminate that um, on, on top of the performance. So it's CDN is, is one of those things where I would, yeah, I, I would definitely say that's, that's almost a no-brainer. Um, it does take some extra configuration. Um, so whether it's your system administrators or your development team, um, but it's, there's a lot of inf information out there, especially with WordPress, um, to enable that and, and, and do it the right way. Yes? Um, so when you're doing uh, performance testing or monitoring, um, are you setting like a performance budget that you want to hit, or does that come from the client, say, or how do you establish this exactly? So, yeah, I mean, I, I've read a lot about performance budgets. We, you know, as, a, as an agency, um, haven't, ha haven't been asked to do that for, for our clients. Um, we, we've set it, so we've set it for our own site, but our own site doesn't have a lot of images, so it's, we're, we're, we're hitting it. Um, that's, that's one of those things where the client or the product team has to be working collaboration. We were actually talking about that um, offline a bit, where, yeah, you need that, per so a performance budget is essentially what it's costing us for, for this performance hit. Um, because you can evaluate um, as whether you're doing new develop or new design development, um, or if you're trying to improve things by, all right, I want to cut this section of the site. Well, that could have a cost. By, you know, let's take, we're going to take away the, the buy now button, or, you know, as a simple thing. So that's going to take a cost, but it might have a huge improvement on performance, which will, you know, add to the budget. So there's a lot of things you have to evaluate there. Um, there and there's no, I, there's a lot of science around it, but I think it's a lot more art with science. Um, and you also, it's a long-term thing. You, know, you can evaluate, adjust, um, and then get the, the formula. Yeah. Can do two more? Two more. Oh, two more? Yes. Oh. Two more or maybe no more. I don't see any hands. Oh, one more. Uh, what about uh, HTTP2? I, I couldn't hear you. Oh, uh, what about HTTP2? Um, as far as how utilizing only HTTP2 now? Yeah, how does that factor into your performance? Uh, um, I mean, at this point, I don't even think of it as I, I honestly don't even go there at, at this point. Um, for, for I just assume um, for, for mobile um, in, in most devices or most browsers. If, if, I'm, if I'm answering or thinking the same thing you're thinking, it doesn't look like I am. <laughs> well, I don't know that much about it myself. But okay. The, um, apparently, you, you don't have to worry about the HTTP requests as much. So, I mean, there, there's one thing around around that around browsers that's, that's close to that would, would be the, the number of requests a browser can make parallel um, has gone up a bit. Um, so at one time it was two, if you can think about that. So if you have 20, 20 things on a page, um, i.e. for a long time, even, even Netscape and things could only request two things at a time. So wait, request two things, wait, request two things, wait. Um, then went up to 10, um, it, it's essentially non-existent, but that's also, there is still a limit, and that's why the aggregation of condensing the number of things you have on the page, doing the lazy loading so that you're not trying to load all these things and you have to figure out what's important. Um, so that does have, have a, a performance impact. I have a question about, uh, do you use site caching plugins at all, like uh, total cache or anything like that? And what you feel is probably the, talking about low-hanging fruit, this one simple configuration setting that so I've, I've moved away a bit for the, for the site caching plugins on the sites that we build a, a lot of times um, because the, the managed, a lot of the managed hosts now are, are, are doing better at um, about caching the data um, and then with the CDN caching the images and, and we're, we're building some caches the HTML as well. 
Um, the, we were using you know, W3 total cache for, for a long, long time on certain things, and then that gets a performance. It, it degrades on, on certain things when you get too much content. So I, I don't have a good answer. Um, so I think that's it. I'm out of time, I believe. Looking over.